Well, my friends, we are in the third week of Advent, and uh, today is really, I think, kind of an interesting bringing together of what life is like and what this season can be like. Um, you see this, the sermon slide today, Advent, a season of hope, love, joy, peace, and sometimes grief. Uh, you know, those, those four words, hope, love, joy, and peace, those are often represented by the Advent candles that we light, and, and we look at this season as a season of hopefulness, and yet we also acknowledge that, it's particularly in the holiday seasons, it's a mixture of emotions, isn't it? And while we have so much to celebrate, we also are well aware of who's not with us. Um, and we're aware of those pains and those hurts in our lives as well. And in our text today, it really does a beautiful job, I think, of bringing together what it means to be God's people. That we are people who celebrate and grieve together. Um, we can uh, be joyful and we can be mourning at the same time. And we get to do those things together. And so, first of all, a quick word at the beginning here. If, if you're one of those people who, if, if you find those emotions coming and you think, oh, I better get out of here before someone notices, I'm going to ask you today to be courageous enough to just stay where you're at. Because this is a place where we get to be as we are. Right? In this church, this isn't a place where we put on fake fronts, where everybody needs to be happy and have it all figured out. This is a place where, where we come just as we are, and that's all okay and what God wants for us. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's, n it's not infrequent that I'll hear from, a, from someone in the congregation will say, Pastor, I, I would have been here last week, but I was just having a hard day and I was afraid I wouldn't be able to keep it together. And my, my response to you all in, large, in a group like this is to say, that's exactly when you need to be here, right? Just come here and lose it. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Um, we do this together. And that's what it means to be God's people. So I just want to put that out there on the front end today, that we're going to be honest enough to acknowledge that we come as whole people. And life is a journey of joy and sorrow and everything in between. And we get to do that together. So in today's reading, uh, it's, really in, it's really, first of all, a, a story of celebration and good news. The promises that we've been hearing about the last couple of weeks as life was just getting destroyed for the Israelites, those God, promises of God... Uh, come to fruition. The exiles in Babylon get to come home. They get to rebuild their temple, and it's a day of great celebration for them. And yet, there's this really, there's this surprise right at the end of the reading where we find out that not everyone is celebrating, and yet they're doing it together. And so, I think there's some really neat touch points for us in this text. But let's, let's do really quick review the last couple of weeks. If you remember two weeks ago, we had the prophet Jeremiah who was in prison in that pit in Jerusalem, and the city was under siege. And in the midst of that hopelessness, he had this word of promise from God that said, hey, my people, there will be a future day where the joy will return to the streets of Jerusalem. There will be a day where God will come and make things right. There's this great promise that someday it would be okay again. And then last week we were with... Um, we were with the prophet Isaiah, who was with the exiled Israelites. Babylon had, had taken over the city of Jerusalem, destroyed everything, and shipped the people off into exile, which, means, which basically means they ripped them away from their homes, took them as refugees to a new place where they were no longer allowed to practice their culture, their faith, uh, their, their language was not spoken. It was a very, very long, difficult uh, decades in exile. And Isaiah spoke from that place of exile, and he said, he, he said, there's hope for the future. God is coming to do something. God is going to take us home. And so in the midst of the darkness in both of those weeks, we had these words of promise from God that God would come and do something. And so that's the context when we come into today's reading. In fact, those promises of God have come to fruition. God has come to do something. But it's from an unlikely source the person God sends, uh, who, who God sends to set them free, is actually Cyrus, the king of Persia. Now, for those of you that um, like to connect the dots on the global scale, Babylon is essentially uh, modern-day Baghdad, and the, the empire of Babylon, you can think of Iraq. The Persians are, are modern-day Iran. And so the Persians come and they take over the Babylonians, and the Persians had a very different way of ruling when they took over an area. So Babylonians took people into exile, turned their lives upside down, ruled them very harshly. The Persians' idea was more like this. We're going to let you do your thing, 
as long as you pay us an annual payment that we require of you. So give us a bunch of money and we'll let you do what you want to do kind of idea. So King Cyrus takes over Babylon and he says to the Israelites, you all can go home now. Go home. And not only that, go home and rebuild your temple. You get to go home. And so uh, that is where we pick up the story today. Uh, the Israelites in exile get to go home. So let's hear that and then we'll, we'll connect some dots. Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, the Lord fulfilled the prophecy he had through Jeremiah. He stirred the heart of Cyrus to put this proclamation in writing and to send it throughout his kingdom. Now pause for a moment. Who stirred Cyrus's heart? God. Does Cyrus worship Yahweh? No. Cyrus is the king of Persia. He does not worship the Jewish God, which makes even what comes next even more interesting that Cyrus feels um, this call from God to empower the Israelites to go and, and live into, their, into um, their worship. So listen to what it happens. This is what King Cyrus of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He's appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Any of you who are his people may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in Jerusalem. And may your God be with you. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let your neighbors contribute toward their expenses by giving them silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock, as well as a voluntary offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Okay, pause there. What kind of news is this? Yeah, this goes beyond good news. This is like pie in the sky. What are you talking about good news? Okay, so the first word is they get to do what? They get to go home. Now for a refugee, that in and of itself is amazing news. But not only do they get to go home, but they're to go home to do what? Build their temple. They get to go home and go back to their, their, their faith that they have been not able to practice for decades now. And not, not only that, but their neighbors are supposed to do some things for them before they leave. What are their neighbors supposed to do? Give them what? Money, supplies, livestock. Oh, oh yeah, and, well, and an offering to help rebuild the temple. This, this like goes beyond any sense. I mean, it's one thing for the prophets to say, you'll get to go home. This will be good news for us. This goes way beyond that uh, they get to go home, rebuild the temple, and they have help in doing so. So this is the best kind of news that they ever could have hoped or imagined. Incredible news. So the Israelites head home. It's a long journey. When they get back to their homeland, they have to rebuild their homes. They have to get things happening again. And, and we pick up the story in chapter 3, and they've now got their, you know, they've got a place now. They've got their homes in place, and now it's time to work on the temple. So in chapter 3. The construction of the temple of God began in mid-spring during the second year after they arrived in Jerusalem. The workforce was made up of everyone who had returned from exile, including Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, Yeshua, son of Jehoshaphat. I've made this joke every service. I'll make it again. I don't know how to say these names. <laughs> we, we all do our best with it, okay? We all do our best with it. So, And I keep getting stuck on that name. Okay. This guy and his fellow priests and all the Levites. All right. So they all went to help. They're all going to work together to rebuild the temple. Great news. Verse 10. When the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets. And the Levites, descendants of Asaph, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. And with praise and thanks, they sang this song to the Lord. He is so good, his faithful love for Israel endures forever. And then all the people gave, gave a great shout, praising the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. Now pause there for a moment. So can you imagine this scene, and can you imagine the joy of these people? Here they had known nothing but death and destruction uh, and they had been living as exiles in this foreign land. Never did they dream that 
I mean, perhaps they dreamed, but never did they think that actually this day would come. And so here they are. The priests are in all their robes. They've got their trumpets. The Levites have their cymbals. And the people of God are gathered together to sing songs of praise. Can you imagine the joy and celebration that they are home and the temple will be rebuilt and they can practice their faith that is most important and central to their lives? There is this incredible celebration and joy. And then we get to the last two verses, and there's something really interesting and powerful here. In verse 12, But many of the older priests, Levites and other leaders who had seen the first temple, wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. And the joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. Now, what a scene. For some, this is a moment of greatest joy and celebration. And for others, this is a moment of deep grief and pain. See, these, the, this older generation, they had been there and seen it before it was all destroyed. They remembered what had been. And so even in this time of celebration, there's grief and there's mourning. But what's so powerful to me in this passage is it's all happening together at once in such a powerful way that the celebrating in the morning, it says it's mingled together in a voice that could be heard far in the distance. In other words, you couldn't distinguish the, the, the cries of mourning from the cries of celebrating. It all mingled together into this beautiful sound that glorified God. Powerful imagery of life as God's people, celebrating and grieving together. And I think for us, this particularly uh, might speak to the context of our congregation, but in a larger way, it speaks to our lives. But here we are, a church, New Heights Church, a church that has come from two previous congregations, our saviors here in Black Earth and St. John's in Mazo, and we have this dream that God has given us to build a new worship place, a community center together, and it won't be long before we're laying that foundation. And there will be a lot to celebrate. And yet in the midst of celebrating, there is also grief. Now some of you in this place are pretty new around here. And some of you have been a part of one of these churches your whole life. And our dear folks who were a part of St. John's, have already in many ways had to grieve leaving that building behind, our building in Mazo. That was a hard journey from there to here. And many still feel that grief. And others of us who have known this place as home, will, I, I suspect, will have a similar feeling of what's being lost or left behind as we go forward. And yet we will move to that place together, and together we will celebrate and we will grieve and we will be God's people making a joyful noise together. Together. You see, what God is reminding us here is that life is full of endings and beginnings. And endings and beginnings provide opportunity for all sorts of things. And oftentimes they come with both joy and sorrow. Not unlike this time of year, we come to the holidays and we recognize that we have so much to be thankful for and so much to celebrate and yet in the midst of that joy there is also grief and sorrow and it's often at Christmas at the holidays that that grief in us bubbles up to the surface and we're aware of who's not here to celebrate with us and we dare gather as God's people with all of that together, we celebrate and we grieve. And God looks at it and says, it's a beautiful thing. It's what it means to be God's people together. That in this place, we come as we are. And we are encouraged and allowed to be who God makes us to be. People who celebrate and people who grieve. And we do it all together as God's people. And my friends, this is the journey of life for us, isn't it? Life of endings and beginnings. But what, what, we, what we see here in this text today is that throughout it all, we, can, we know that God's promises, that we can count on those promises of God. 
that God is with us every step of the way. That this promise through Isaiah and Jeremiah that God would set things right, that God would bring them home, actually came to fruition. And that God's promise to us that he would send his son to die for us, he would send a Messiah, that that promise has come to fruition. That Jesus has come to give his life for us. That you and I have been claimed and saved and forgiven and promised eternal life. These are God's promises that we can claim, that we can cling to, that we can stand on. These are God's promises that buoy us in this life. And so, my friends, in just a little over a week's time, can you believe it? Ten days from now, we will be celebrating Christ's birth. We will be proclaiming the good news that God has come to set things right, to do something. And yet, the day after Christmas, we will continue on with our everyday lives, And things will still not all be right and well in the world. And we live in this already but not yet life of endings and beginnings. But we walk this journey together. We walk this life together. And so we celebrate together and we grieve together. And we come to this place as God's people and in one room. When I cannot celebrate, you celebrate for me. And when you cannot celebrate, I celebrate for you. We grieve together and we celebrate together and we walk together. That is what it means to be God's people. And so we read today that the joyful shouting and the weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard far in the distance. And God was glorified in that sound, that mingled sound. And so we come to this place. And you know, it's one of the um, incredible blessings of what I get to do. I stand here and see you. I see all of you. And that's one of the most powerful things for me. When I preach, I look at you. And I see joy and I see sorrow. And I know um, who needs healing oftentimes. And I know who's celebrating something wonderful that's happened. And we bear one another's burdens. But what an incredible gift and joy it is for me. Oftentimes, when you're facing forward and nobody's looking at you, you might be a a little more uh, agreeable to allowing things to come through. We're more apt to hide things when others are looking, right? And so I get insight sometimes that we don't share with everyone. But what a blessing it is for me. And I say to you, this is what God wants for us as God's people, that we do this together. That's what we do here. So thank you for having the courage to come to this place and be who you are. Thank you for having the courage to come here and allow yourself to be real, to be honest, to be loved, to be forgiven, to be celebrated, and sometimes uh, to just be held. This is what we do together as God's people. And so Advent is a season of hope, love, joy, peace, and sometimes, maybe oftentimes, grief. And that's what it means to be God's people. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your promises that are trustworthy and true. Thank you, God, that we can stand firm on your promises. That as we walk this life with endings and beginnings and joy and sorrow, that no matter what, you are with us every step of the way, that you walk with us. And Lord, today we're especially grateful for a community of believers through which we can journey together. In this place, we can help one another stand when we can't stand on our own. And in this place, we lift one another up in joy and celebration. In this place, we come before you honestly, vulnerably, wholeheartedly, Because we are your people. Your dearly loved, forgiven, renewed people. 
And we are grateful, God, that you give us all things. And so today, Lord, as we continue this journey forward, may we continue to look to you, to trust in you, to follow you. May may we allow your good news, your good news of the cross, to shape us, to heal us, to guide us. We thank you, Lord, that we get to journey together. May our joy and our sorrow mingle together to bring you glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. So I invite you to a few minutes of prayer. Talk to God about those hurts in your heart right now. Make some room for the Spirit to bring some healing. And if you're feeling today like, you know, I'm really in a really good place, then please pray for those around you. Lift them to the Lord.